Welcome, welcome, welcome to another of our Wednesday Yachting Luncheons. It's wonderful to be here in the grill room of the St. Francis Yacht overlooking the beautiful San Francisco Bay. Uh, a little bit about future speakers. So in May, that would be the 29th of May, you want to stop. Well, first of all, let's do June 12. Luke Muller, who's going for a berth in the upcoming Olympics. This is the last time the Finn will be in the Olympics, and Luke is in a Duke It Out event with Caleb Payne, who won a bronze medal in uh, Rio de Janeiro. So they'll, he'll be here on June 12. On May 29th, Terry Hutchinson, the skipper of the New York Yacht Club American Magic uh, America's Cup Syndicate, will be here to talk to us all about New York Yacht Club's efforts to bring the cup back from New Zealand. Uh, in May, you'll also come by to hear about Channing Robertson talk about what nature can teach us about speed. Um, uh, Rick Paulson will be here. He's a White House calligrapher. He'll talk to us all about the nautical uh, heritage of calligraphy. Patrick Hunt in April will be here to talk all about nautical uh, naval surprises that Hannibal used uh, 2,000 years ago, including the first biological warfare. Uh, on March 20th, you want to come by and listen to one Dewey Hines. Have we heard of Dewey Hines? Dewey will be here to talk all about um, growing up in the grill room. Uh, St. Francis Yacht Club in the 1950s. Who's more qualified to speak about that? Uh, who was a member in the 50s? I want to see the hands. We know John and Mary. Uh, we know Packy Davis. We know uh, Jimmy DeWitt. Uh, then, of course, on March the 6th, Caleb Payne with a bronze medal on the mantle. He'll be here to talk about, you know, time to go for the gold. And so we have great, um, great speakers coming up. And before we go any further, before I talk about today's speaker, um, we also want to mention the upcoming auction on March the 12th for the St. Francis Sailing Foundation. If you haven't yet, please do buy your tickets and come along to the big fundraiser. It's always an incredible event. Uh, and we want to introduce and bring along the Commodore of the St. Francis Yacht Club, a great sailor himself, Paul Heineken. Paul. My job is simply to welcome everybody, and that's everybody in the room, all of our members, all of our guests, and all of our guests online, uh, because we're going to have lots of people interested in the California Delta, as we all are, and I can't thank Ron enough for putting, putting together these incredible programs. We all benefit, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to today, and it looks like a lot of people were sick of being holed up in the rain for the last few days, <laughs> so we're all here today to dry out, so thanks, Ron. Good on you, mate. Good on you. So uh, tell me, what do these cities have in common? San Francisco, South San Francisco, Daly City, San Bruno, Millbrae, Burlingame, Redwood City, Redwood Shores, Santa Clara, San Jose, Milpitas, Fremont, San Lorenzo, San Leandro, Oakland, Berkeley, Emeryville, Albany, Vallejo, uh, San Rafael, um, Larkspur, Tiburon, Belvedere, Mill Valley, Sausalito. They all share what our region is called, San Francisco Bay. We are known as the San Francisco Bay Area. Before I introduce today's speaker, I... <laughs> I want to point out that before we hear all about the California Delta, we have to think about its future and ours because they are completely interconnected. There's currently a project to put what was going to be one, but now will be one 40-foot diameter tunnel above the Delta to suck water from it underground and drop it below the Delta and then ship it to Southern California. As a boy who started sailing on this bay, you know, before I, uh, when I was a junior high schooler, I can tell you that without the water flushing out the San Francisco Bay, it's not going to seem the same, smell the same, be the same, and we are all going to suffer. Look at Lake Merritt, look at Lake Merced, look at the Los Angeles River. We do not want 
that kind of fate to befall our San Francisco Bay. So while we listen to the history of the Delta, we all have to do what we can to preserve it and make sure that we have it for the next year and our generations to follow. So we will be hosting at the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon a series of speakers, thanks to the really good work of Vice Chairman of the Committee, Kathy Trafton. Kathy, thank you so much. We are... We are lining up a whole series of speakers. It's interesting to say that when we find people who are in favor of stopping the Twin Tunnels, they hold their hand up. When we talk to the people who are in favor of building the Twin Tunnels, they don't want to hold their hand up. They say, we're neutral. But in reality, they're trying to steal our water. I remember the first, the first peripheral canal in the 60s which we were told there's just going to be one peripheral canal to divert water from the Delta to L.A. If you fly over, there are now five. When they get a tunnel, they will fill it up with water. And if you think about how much water will go in a 40-foot diameter tunnel and you've been in the Delta, you'll say, that's a lot of the water that we use to clean San Francisco Bay. So we all have to do what we can, and we will do our part to raise awareness of this important, important issue. So I have to say all that before we talk about our speaker today, because his talk and the future of the Delta are, as I've said, intertwined. So think about being a six-month-old and think about being in your daddy's speedboat. All you can remember is nothing. <laughs> My first images of being on a boat, he said, our speaker said, I don't know, I was six months old. But I was told, all in all in all, that was me. That's my picture. I'm in that speedboat with my dad. And his next image, which he can remember, is being a 10-year-old at Perry's up in the Delta, spending a weekend cruising around with the family in the California Delta. And at 24 years of age, he was uh, sailing around in catamarans and missing the Delta. He came back, and at age 40, he got his own 1937, Incidentally, I am also dumb enough to have a boat that old. A boat built in 1937, the same year as the Golden Gate Bridge, his Stevens 36-foot powerboat uh, cruiser, and he started cruising around the Delta. In 04, he became the executive director of the, Calif of the Delta Chamber, and in 2006, he took just a kind of a fill-in job, help out in Bay and Delta Yachtsman for two months as a kind of helper. He could help writing. I love the Bay and Delta Yachts when I had a column in it in the 80s, at that long time ago. And um, I remember as a kid in 1957 being told by the older Sea Scout kids, we're going to get on this 30-foot whaleboat and we're going to the Delta. And what did I know as a 13-year-old? I remember waking up on Steamboat Slough and it was this incredible little paradise up there. And we had no engine and when it was really light air, we rode. 13-year-olds rowing a 30-foot whale boat, and we began to get our first view of the incredible, beautiful, beautiful paradise, which is being preserved by thoughtful people like those in the room, and especially the executive director of the Bay Chamber, our speaker today, Bill Wells. Bill. I don't know if I can live up to that introduction, but thank you very much, Ron. Um, if I could add one thing on the uh, the tunnels, in uh, I've been involved in that for at least the last 12 years. But uh, in human history, there's never been a case of uh, diverting a water or a, a, a waterway with a tunnel or canal, or whatever, that has not damaged or destroyed the existing waterway. So, and that's the one thing we kept asking uh, the Department of Water Resources and all those folks. Just give us a few examples, and we'll shut up. But so far, none. So. Anyway, um, okay, um, I was uh, trying to come up with a title for the uh, presentation. Is Ken Scheidegger out there by any chance? Oh, okay, where? Oh, hey, Ken. So anyway, um, I, I do a lot, of, I always do test marketing. So my idea for a title was I wanted it to be um, my life in the Delta. So I talked to Ken about it to see what he thought. And he says, well, Bill, I think you ought to call it my lie in the Delta. So. Anyway, I decided just to not to go with the title. So anyway, Ken, thank you for the input as always. <laughs> so, so, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Ty Malott, the publisher of Bandel the Yachtsman magazine there, who uh, gave me my big break in life. So, uh, 
there's a lot of folks in the Delta Chamber here. Blair Hake, uh, former president, uh, one of our directors, Patty Brennan, uh, Phil Delano, former director. Uh, if you, uh, don't leave uh, port without uh, knowing Phil because he's the guy that comes and rescues you. And it's if you have insurance prepaid, it's a lot cheaper than the alternative, by far, by far. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Claude and Tim are here from um, um, Village West Marina. So thank you guys very much. Uh, Todd Hornbeck from... Uh, Delta Coves is here. I just saw, oh hey Todd yeah thanks for coming. Um, that's the uh, project in Bethel Island. Uh, they've uh, um, breached the levee and uh, built a built a 200 boat slips in there. Or 200 homes, Todd and stuff. So anyway, so just the the Delta is happening. A lot of people are investing a lot of money in it, and uh, so it's going to come back to better than its former glory. So anyway. Um, the fabulous California Delta, this is the uh, government chart. Uh, and you know, take note of the uh, deep water channel, um, kind of going through the middle of it that goes from, uh, that's right through Venice Island, as a matter of fact. So again, this is the uh, government version. And this is reality in the Delta. You can see San Francisco, and you sail up through the Straits of Carquinas and into the Delta, you get lost. And if you're not careful, you fall off the edge. So. Uh, that's the way it is. <laughs> I'll tell you what, and my other job at the Delta Chambers, I answer the phone. So it, it, every summer, I invariably get uh, I'm inundated with calls of, yeah, we're coming up to the Delta, and I see all these toolies, and which way do I go? And I say, well, take a look at your chart. And What's a chart? And so they get, I get a lot of calls of people. They call us and say, can I get a map of the Delta? We're going to cruise our boat up there. And I say, well, you need the NOAA uh, charts, 18661 and 18662 for the Delta. And they'll say, what's NOAA? <laughs> so anyway, but uh, we do our best to educate folks. OK, um, this is one of my um, earlier yachting adventures. Uh, we actually migrated out here from Iowa. So my first boating experience was were on uh, my father's boat at Storm Lake, Iowa. Uh, and my uh, grandfather and most of my family were boaters. My great uncle died on the uh, Missouri River. He was in a uh, skiff and vanished. He was duck hunting out there. Never found him again. But uh, if you remember, uh, Lake Tahoe, Globin's Pier was a favorite spot. We used to go up almost every year. Um, this is my first threesome. That's Mimi and Molly Culbertson with me. Um, it, was, it was, okay, it was actually my only threesome, so. <laughs> so. But if you remember back then, uh, right after World War II, there were literally thousands of uh, airplane uh, wing tanks and belly tanks, fuel tanks, laying around. And uh, um, somebody invented a way to uh, weld them together and use them as a boat. So you could rent one of those for like a dollar a day. And we used to go, like we'd paddle the thing underneath Globin's Pier and all over the place. We had a lot of fun. It was very cheap entertainment at the time. And I'm still friends with Mimi and Molly. We're in our 70s now, and uh, they're just uh, charming folks. So we've, we write to each other once in a while. OK, Delta timeline. Gosh, darn, I should have made this a little bigger. I'll just skip over a few things, but uh, a very significant event. Sutter gets lost uh, for eight days when he was trying to move up to his uh, land grant in the Delta, um, right around the confluence of the Sacramento and uh, San Joaquin rivers. He um, uh, cruised around there and then finally did find the right river. And if you've been up there, I've gotten lost on a foggy day up there when you can't see the uh, markers. So uh, anyway, it's real interesting. Uh, 1848, Captain Weber found Stockton uh, and he had built a house on Weber Point. Real significant date, 1886, Gottlieb Daimler and Wilhelm Maybach uh, supposedly put the first internal combustion engine in a boat. So that started power boating. Before that, to go to the Delta, you sailed up and then waited to, for the wind to try to get you back downstream, unless you had a steam-powered boat, which seemed to work. Um, and uh, I pour over the Stevens records all the time, but uh, they the first boat they call a cruiser was built in 1915. That was a sea urchin. Uh, I don't have any details on that, but after that, uh, many of their boats were called cruisers. And I, it was really strange. I've been looking at those records for, I don't know, 15 or 20 years, however long they've been up online. And uh, just the other day, I discovered a family friend uh, had a boat commission in 1948, Warren Taylor. And I forget the name. Oh, the Corabel was named after his mother. But uh, he was a prominent Sacramento businessman. And uh, anyway, it's really interesting to see his. He had a 30-foot Stevens, 34-foot Stevens. 
1929, Sacramento Yacht Club founded. I get a lot of calls from folks in uh, area yacht clubs, and they say, well, our yacht club's the oldest in the area, right? But Sacramento, and it actually is founded on some other earlier boating clubs. So as near as I can tell, that's the very first one. Stockton Yacht Club, a close second, 1930. There's a lot of, Randy and Linda, a lot of folks from Stockton Yacht Club here, as a matter of fact, so uh, say hi. <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, you can see up until today, uh, gosh, don't forgive me. This is much better. Uh, Hal Shell, you remember him, uh, arrives in the Delta in 1960. Tinsley Island, founded in 1958. You know, I've, I've always heard this rumor about how the folks from St. Francis uh, were asked not to come back to Grindstone Joe's, so they wanted to get their own island. They looked for Lost Isle, and then uh, that didn't pan out, so you got Tinsley. So I, that's the rumor. I don't know any facts on it. But there's a, another even more interesting rumor. Apparently, in 1972, the head exploded in one of the uh, bathrooms at the uh, island, and I, uh, the Sea Scouts were there on a cruise, and apparently they haven't been invited back. So, again, that's... Anyway, that's, uh, that's what my sources tell me. Um, Hal Shell, as you know, uh, became the Delta Dollar and wrote several books about the Delta. 1958, Baron Hilton starts shooting fireworks off at Venice Island to entertain his family. And his story is that uh, his family um, would enjoy him and people would be stopping by on boats on the 4th of July. So that expanded up to where the, now there's sometimes thousands of boats up there. So. Very interesting. One other, I'm sorry I'm going backwards on this. Uh, Irma Lou II, uh, 1937 Stevens, was uh, launched uh, hull number 624 uh, and uh, was built for Louis C. Boone. Um, I mentioned that to Mel Owen, who's in the audience today. And um, Mel uh, says, uh, oh, yeah, we knew Louis Boone. Uh, his wife didn't like boating, and they sold the boat about 1940 and bought a farm from us up in, was Petaluma, Mel? Napa, okay, yeah, Napa. And... Uh, got rid of, sold the boat. So I think if you do the math, what, uh, if you had a farm in Napa now versus a 1937 boat, uh, you know, <laughs> so. Anyway, we'll go over some of these other ones. Uh, uh, 1940, by the way, uh, Mel's dad got uh, lightning in a uh, uh, um, Lake Union dry dock boat and renamed her Pat Fending. So more about that later. Okay, this is an early map of the Delta. Notice they say map. And you can kind of see from between Rio Vista and the town of Stockton, uh, it's a whole maze of waterways. So that's what they straightened out uh, to make the uh, Stockton Deep Water Channel. Um, the, um, notice the area has been called the uh, California Delta since the early 1900s. Um, anyway, th so that's actually created many, many new islands in the, in the Delta. Okay, Chris Lawrenson, who owns Lawrenson Yacht Harbor, is a personal friend of mine. And uh, he told me at one time that his, uh, great, his grandfather uh, was born on Wood Island. And uh, I asked him where that was, and he said, well, it's under uh, I-5 in uh, Stockton. They used it to build the, uh, the ramps there. But apparently the island was actually off the shore of Rio Vista, uh, up until the early 1900s, and they dredged it and put the spoils down the stream from Rio Vista. And uh, now, uh, when they built the I-5 overpass, they took it over there. So it's kind of interesting to say, like, uh, where, where's Wood Island under I-5? So. Grindstone Joe come up, came, comes up to the Delta approximately 1906, uh, and at some point he got an altercation with his partner. This is the actual original Grindstone. I was lucky to be invited over there one time and got this photo. Um, Grindstone Joe actually died in 1944, and that's when all the uh, people that went there would get together and uh, bought the uh, island peninsula now. Okay, this is a cover. It's a front and back cover of a book by Hal Shell. I spliced them together the best I could with Photoshop. That's why it might look a little jagged in the middle. But uh, this, at this time, the boat was called the Virginia S, but uh, she was launched as the USS Sassoon. She was a Corps of Engineers boat. And um, back in the early 1900s, the Guadalupe River was actually navigable, uh, you know, far <laughs> a few miles up there. So she'd cruised up there. But uh, she worked for the Corps of Engineers for many years. 
and uh, she was powered with a cordless engine. And I, uh, Bill Connor, who knows quite a bit about the boat, was familiar with the motor. And he told me it was a four-cylinder cordless, but I, I read in everything I've ever read said it's a six-cylinder. But it had like an 11-inch uh, bore, and I've got thousands of cubic inches, and it's um, um, about 200 horsepower or something like that. But I'm sure it has a lot of torque. But you know, they only built three of them. They're built in Petaluma. But I just I, in my search, I was I just happened to find this slide. So um, she was owned by Mr. Case, who uh, lived aboard with his wife. They lived at McLeod Lake in Stockton for many years, and they finally got kicked out of there, and they moved her down to Lost Isle, and he was there for many years, too. Um, Bill uh, Connor, who owned, uh, owned Lost Isle when um, the St. Francis Yacht Club didn't buy it, told me a story of uh, uh, Case took the boat to Stevens to have it hauled out and have the bottom done. So, uh, and he called Bill to come over and help him bring it back to Lost Isle. So as they're getting ready to launch the boat, Bill says, do you have plenty of fuel? And the guy, yeah, sure. And uh, they, <laughs> uh, they la launched the boat. And it, if you've been in the Stevens over there, the channel's about 200 yards wide. And he s said, first of all, the first thing that happened, the, they didn't have it tied to the shore. And the boat started drifting to the other side. They finally got the motor started and pulled away so they didn't hit the side. So uh, they cruised about uh, down to where the I-5 overpass is today and ran out of fuel. And uh, so they had a uh, Briggs & Stratton gasoline-powered pump aboard, and Bill says they were able to get a gallon of gas out of the fuel tank of that and pour it in the tank and fire it up again. The, the motor, by the way, had an air compression uh, starting thing, which wasn't working, so they had to put a, a crowbar in a, on the flywheel in a fulcrum and fired it over that way. But these kind of these old motors, they'd kick over once if you could just get a spark and fuel to them. But, so on one gallon of gas, they made it down to Stevens Landing or uh, River, uh, the uh, Stevens Place on the river down there, ran out of gas again, and they hailed some fishermen and the, uh, asked the fishermen to go ashore and get them some gas. So here comes uh, later on uh, Theo Stevens out with five gallons of gas, and they pour that in there. So they use that, and they make it down to uh, Lost Isle. And they, Bill says it's a really windy day, and they were just pulling up to the mooring, and the engine died again. So they made it without mishap. So uh, anyway, <laughs> myself, I'm pretty paranoid. I've, I top off my fuel tanks all the time. <laughs> Okay, this, um, she was um, renamed, um, after Mr. Case died, uh, she was renamed MV Sassoon, and uh, she was actually right here, and there was an international tour of astronauts that were aboard at one time. The gentleman hanging on to the uh, um, flag in the bow was apparently the one that restored her, and uh, unfortunately she burned a couple years later, so it's regretful. The, I hear that uh, now she is uh, over at Bethel Island and somebody's built a houseboat superstructure on her and she's still there. Um, I heard the cordless engine was taken to some museum down in Fresno, but you know, you hear all these rumors, so uh, that's the best I know about that. Okay, this is um, Steamboat Slough. Uh, there was an island in it. Uh, called Charleston Island up until the 50s. Nikki Serrard owns in uh, Snug Harbor there now. So because she's an excellent historian, by the way. Look at her website. She's got all kinds of stuff, maps and charts. Um, they changed it to Snug Harbor, and nowadays it's a really nice uh, resort. This is an aerial view I took a few years ago. The peninsula that, uh, where it joins the lands up in the upper part of the uh, photograph. And lo and behold, when I was doing my research, here's the Virginia S again. Uh, this is about 1971. She's apparently been used by the Sea Scouts. I'm not sure if this is the time they ra uh, raided uh, Tinsley Island, but uh, anyway. And this is a recent photo. It's a really nice resort, a you know, quiet place for people to folks stay. Uh, Okay, um, Bandelli Yachtsman magazine, you realize it is a uh, glossy magazine. It started out as, like, as a newspaper and it was actually printed by the uh, folks in Rio Vista, the River News Herald there. And uh, I'm not sure, Ty, do you know when they went to a magazine format? Mid 80s? Okay. Anyway, very popular magazine. Okay, I told you earlier about Irma Lou too, uh, and she was renamed uh, Layla Bob until about 1955. Then she's renamed Kayleen, 1955 to 1973. You can see the gentleman in white standing on the deck, and then the other lady uh, on uh, sitting on the deck, and they're basically uh, the second boat in. And I think I'm not sure, but I think this is up at either Railroad Cut or the Meadows. I haven't been able to nail, nail it down exactly. 
Okay, she was, then she was renamed Lollipop for the 70s and uh, kind of in keeping with the uh, era. Um, the, this gentleman added the flybridge, as you can see. So I got the boat in 1993. The flybridge had already been removed by another previous owner. But even today, people I'll talk about my boat, and people will come up to me and say, is that the one that had that ugly-looking flybridge on it? You know, so... Uh, I say, yeah, yeah. So, and there's actually remnants. There's like a hatch cut in the, the overhead and stuff. But, uh, so I've cruised this boat around for 25 years out in the Delta and had a lot of fun. I'll say the guy, the, the fellow that owned it before me was a furniture maker, and she was looking beautiful, but he didn't know how to start it. Or he didn't know anything about motors, and it barely ran when I bought it. But I'm more of a tune-up guy, and I can change plugs and points and stuff. So she runs good, but doesn't look quite as good now. Okay, Pat Penning, I mentioned that to you earlier. Uh, here she is cruising off of uh, Angel Island. It appears to be Mel at the uh, upper helm there, I believe. But she's a very famous boat. Now, she, again, she was conscripted uh, into the Navy on the 9th, 9th of December, Mel? December night, yeah. Okay. Anyway, several boats in the area. There was one. Uh, it, I don't know if you remember this, Mel, but uh, we were there was one boat. Uh, yours was YP one one seven. One one seven, one one eight, and one one nine. Anyway, uh, uh, one of them we couldn't figure out the name of for a long time was one one eight, but it's uh, Papoose. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. It's interesting. They were all delivered to Treasure Island. Uh, the Navy called uh, on Monday morning, December 8th, and said deliver the boat by noon on Tuesday to Treasure Island. Uh, they then uh, paid for them, sent us a check. We got it in uh, 43. But the first, the first uh, boat delivered was Don Beacon's uh, father's Sanadu, and she's 117. Papoose was delivered next. She's 118, and we're 119. Papoose is now in Venice. Oh, wow. uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Mel. Anyway, yeah, Papoose, uh, we, uh, we were trying to find out what YP118 was for a long time, and then some, I guess Mel figured it out. Okay, the, thing, the charming thing on Mel's boat, and I'm pretty sure it's still there, was a uh, plaque on how to set off the depth charges that they had on the back. And I, the thing that's always amazed me, I, I know I grew up watching uh, Victory at Sea, and when they drop a depth charge off there, there's a gigantic explosion. And I'm always wondering, what, you know, if you set one for 30 feet down, how far away you can get from it before it blows you up along with it. But uh, apparently the boat survived the, uh, the ordeal. Anyway, that's a fantastic plaque. And, uh, no, okay, another little, talk about, um, uh, you know, false memories. I distinctly remember seeing a picture of her, I think, with a, a deck gun. I asked Mel about it the other day, and he says, no, he's been looking for that picture, too. So I, don't, I guess, I don't know if I saw another boat or just dreaming that or whatever. So Anyway, here she is in the 70s cruising uh, stock in deep water channel. This is out of Hal Shell's book. Uh, they hadn't uh, revarnished the sides yet, but uh, that was coming. And here's Mel and Gig relaxing aboard a few years back. Here's a picture of Lost Isle. Um, that schooner was there, and I f can't remember the story on it. It was a live aboard. It was in fairly rough shape at the time, but Lost Isle's been closed for about 10 years now, so uh, we're every, every year the Stockton record calls me up and says, well, what do you think about Lost Isle? Is it going to open? I said, well, I don't know. <laughs> you know. Now I'm saying apparently not, so it doesn't look like it's going to go anywhere, but it's too bad. It was a fun place. Okay, Hilltop 2, 44-foot, uh, uh, 1940 Stevens. Jim um, Sweeney's over there in Bernadette. Um, another beautiful Stevens. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, Dick Ingfer. The other people. <laughs> You're in here too, don't worry, Jim. <laughs> I thought I saw Dick earlier, excuse me. So, anyway, 1949, uh, Dick and Susie Ingfer uh, purchased Mia Hilo 3 from John Hallenbeck, and they renamed her Hilltop. Uh, Hollenbeck's uh, condition on that was that he was able to retain the name Mia Hilo, which he commissioned for another boat. Anyway, that's uh, Dick Engfer's father, Dick, uh, and John. So they had the transom uh, renamed, and uh, they've been cruising that boat since 1949. She's still a beautiful boat. Now, I, uh, Dick kind of gave me the... Uh, 
access to his family archives, so I found this picture. If you're ever in the Delta, if you haven't run aground, you haven't spent much time up there. I've, I've run aground many, many times, not lately, though. I've learned my lesson, I think. But uh, so I asked Dick about this picture, and, and he says, well, his father was pretty, his father was single-handing it and coming back from Stockton, and uh, he uh, couldn't uh, tell Dick too much about it, so uh, Dick think there was some skullduggery or something, but apparently it's an embarrassing episode. And he, I guess he floated off on his own, by the way, when the tide came in. Okay, Moore's Riverboat, another Delta icon, uh, started in 1966. An old steamer uh, Captain Moore brought in, uh, Ken's father-in-law. And uh, that's one of the most popular spots in the Delta. Here's an aerial view. That's it kind of in the center of the picture, the white shape there. That's the McCullamy River going down, feeding into the uh, San Joaquin River. And, okay. Um, so in the deal of the century, uh, they had a fire aboard, and Ken sold the, uh, the steamboat to uh, San Joaquin Yacht Club uh, for a dollar, I believe, Ken. Yes? Okay, dollar. Uh, anyway, the, <laughs> the, the worst deal in the, of the century for San Joaquin Yacht Club, but she's still floating down there, uh, amazingly, and uh, it's, it's still the, there's a little slant to the deck, but nice clubhouse. Uh, so Ken gets the Catfish Cafe in, uh, from Stockton and moves it down. So that's been the Moores River boat for the last 20 some odd years. There's a couple of famous yachts uh, in the picture here on the left hand side uh, Miss 102, Rusty Rios, member of the uh, St. Francis Yacht Club. On the right, Flamingo, a good friend of ours, that's a uh, Chris Craft. Seagull, another uh, famous boat. I'm sorry I'm dwelling on all these Stevens, but they're actually probably the most common boats up there for the older boats. Um, this was owned by a friend of mine, Doug Ball, for many years, uh, and his wife, Sean. The boat was launched in uh, 1954, and uh, within a year, there's a propane explosion aboard and blew the whole superstructure off. And um, the, the owner and his granddaughter were apparently aboard and lived through the explosion, which, you know, in gas, for some reason, gas explosions, if you're right in the explosion, you s can survive easier than being outside. But supposedly, they were able to take the boat back up to uh, Stevens uh, under her own power, and they rebuilt her. And I heard they launched her again as a new boat. So. Okay, Doug was a... Uh, Kind of like a lot of us in the Classic Yacht Association, we had no idea what the heck we were doing. Um, Doug's an airline pilot. He said he, ne he said he never touched a hammer in his life until he bought his boat. And uh, so he buys this beautiful Stevens and takes her into Bob Walton's yard in Rio Vista and to have the bottom painted. So they, Bob hauls her out of the water. He says, well, I can't paint the bottom. And Doug says, why? He says, well, it's, all the wood is completely rotted out. There is there's no bottom left. So... Doug spent seven years, and he stripped her down to bare wood, replaced much of the planking, uh, and um, he told me he was designing his electrical uh, panels while he's uh, on his job flying. He said he'd take off, set the autopilot, and then work on his uh, stuff until it was time to land. So, <laughs> Western Airlines. <laughs> they, they finally got rid of him, actually. <laughs> I guess the whole airline's gone now. But uh, anyway... Uh, he uh, uh, did a stunning job. I mean, just a, a just a beautiful job. And you can see how bad it looks right here. And he was again seven years worth of work and spare time. Uh, Seagal, you've seen her, I'm sure. Um, she's I think she's at Bethel Island now, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, this is a few. This is when Doug still owned her, but uh, he, they just did a beautiful job on her and uh, just stunning. Okay, I mentioned the uh, Sweeney's earlier. This is a, steam, a steamboat called Leviathan that's uh, headed out of B&W. Um, and you can't see it in the picture too well, but there's a well, one-pounder strong cannon aimed right at, right, right at the camera person. Uh, this is out of Hal Shell's book, too. So Jim and Bernadette and their children started out with the steamboat. And I, I think it originally had a gas engine. You put the steam engine in, Jim. Yeah. But uh, anyway, uh, so they cruised around in that. And it actually cruised from the um, bay up to uh, B&W Resort for a uh, um, steamboat meet every year. And uh, Jim would force his children to work down and stoking coal into the boiler to keep the thing going all the time. So at some point, Child Protective Services got after him. That's, by the way, 
That's, that's Jim on the right in the white and the kids. I guess he cleaned them up for the photograph at least. And you can still see the cannon there. So um, anyway, the, the family convinced him to get rid of um, the Leviathan. They bought Bounty, which is another Stevens. This is a 1935 picture of uh, Bounty at Grindstone Joe's. And this is her today. Uh, Jim and Bernadette have had her just an absolute stunning boat and um, one of the more beautiful boats on the Delta and the Bay. Okay, Ride Hotel, I'm sure you've all heard the legends there. Uh, the one you see today is actually the third one. Uh, they had two, the two others, I believe, were burned down by fire. Uh, the Juicy family uh, has ties to the Ride Hotel. Uh, we've had a lot of parties there, and I've spent, uh, uh, soon I've spent time in the rooms there. We had a party there one time, and uh, um, we uh, hired, there's a reg legend of a ghost in the hotel, so we hired a psychic to uh, do readings, and we were down in the, uh, basement and uh, a friend of ours was there and his wife had just passed away recently and he had a new girlfriend and he brought two wristwatches that his wife had given him as a, a gift. So uh, the, the psychic said that the ghost of his wife was there and uh, she approved of his new relationship. So then after that we had a few drinks and all went to bed. Well, then the next morning he comes down and uh, Sue and I are in the dining room and he comes down and looks at the clock on the wall and he looks at his watch and comes over and says, Oh my God, Bill! You won't believe what happened. I said, "What?" And he said, "You know, the the the, the ghost is real. That um, they set my watch, both of my watches, back one hour." And um, I said, "Oh my God, that's really interesting." So my wife's a former school teacher and the most practical person in the world, and she says, "Well, you know, daylight savings kicked in last night." <laughs> so anyway, that that happened. So we have never let him live that down. So. Okay, another photo of the Wright Hotel. This, uh, every, uh, that's the other thing. A lot of people say, oh, yeah, that's the hotel that's on the, uh, the uh, Hotel California album of the Eagles. It's not. It's quite similar looking in color, but it's a different hotel. Of course, Pirates Lair, uh, that's, they started out with uh, about a 50 acres, I think 47 acres, and uh, uh, Mrs. Korth, uh, they had so much, they wanted to be asparagus farmers, so Mrs. Korth uh, um, would come every uh few days to check the place out and all their stuff would be stolen so at some point she commented to her husband that this is nothing but a pirate's lair so that's how the name course pirate's lair uh, you see uh, Ken and uh, Laura's place just upstream from that uh, the uh, riverboat and then Willowbury Marina just upstream from that and up on the top of the picture that waterway that's the McCullamy River coming down to the San Joaquin Here's a famous Bay Area boat that Alma uh, makes a trip up there once in a while this is actually a course so they can get into the harbor if you ever drive by course uh, it, in the summer, you always every, invariably be a bunch of people sitting on Adirondack chairs out in front. You know, we call them the lawn people. So they <laughs> they pontificate on everything going on in the world. The gentleman standing there with the bottle, that's Tiki Tom Tate. He's the manager of the arena, the pleasant guy. If your boat breaks down in the McCullamy River out there, you can call him and he will come out and rescue you somehow. Okay, Westlake, you hear Rusty Rios talk about Westlake quite a bit. Um, she hauled number 19, uh, 900 and built in 1951. She, um, Rusty was trying to find her for years and years. He thought that would be a good boat until he finally found her, bought Miss 102. Um, and uh, she was owned by Henry Dolger, who developed uh, Daly City in uh, South San Francisco. Um, and a beautiful boat, 85-footer. And she was, at the time, they said she was uh, equipped with every modern convenience. She had air conditioning, TV, and who knows what else. But I found this letter in the files. I don't know if you can see it, but it's a letter from Henry Dolger to Dick Stevens that they'd lost the sounding thing for the uh, fuel tank overboard and uh, wanted to, uh, he wanted another one. So I, I can't believe, I'm, I've got fuel gauges in my boat that I installed myself, and I still use a thing, a, a rod, but uh, it's uh, interesting to be so concerned about that. She was renamed uh, Duchess II and moved to uh, Louisiana um, sometime in the 1980s. Uh, Mr. Poole uh, owned her, and he did a lot of work. He uh, remodeled the interior, made it look more like 80s rather than early 50s, and um, he really loved the boat. Unfortunately, uh, he was having her move to uh, Florida, and she caught fire. It sounded like an engine room fire, and I think possibly maybe the uh, water wasn't going through. But uh, anyway, she burned out in the Caribbean. The, the crew had to be rescued. And, yeah, pretty sad. I mean, that's the way a lot of boats end, unfortunately. 
One of the highlights of our uh, past decade is uh, David McDonald uh, brought his book Casino Royale into, this, into Stockton. He had to stop in Miami and have the mast shortened a few feet. It's about a 52-foot clearance at the bridge, the I-5 bridge, and they shortened the mast so they could get under. But he spent the summer here, and it was just a, what a fine gentleman he was, uh, and had a few parties for people, and uh, just a pleasant person. If you look to the right of the picture, that little boat under the bow, that's my, my boat. I thought it'd be kind of nice to be in the shade under the bow there. <laughs> but uh, he could, I mean, he could, he could actually put my boat in the swimming pool on his boat almost. <laughs> okay. Um, it, it, Hal Shell really is the one that uh, yeah, I think over the last several decades really did a lot to publicize the Delta. And he passed away uh, about 10 years ago, and they, uh, he was working on a book when he died. And they finished the book, and uh, um, I actually worked with the author, and we did a presentation. And I commented to her, I said, gosh, you have a picture of Hal Shell without a beer in his hand, without a Heineken beer in his hand. And she said, yeah, uh, we actually, he had one. We had to Photoshop it out. So I literally, myself, I never saw him without a Heineken beer in his hand. A sad loss. Dedrick Dennison, um, I don't know if any of you know him, but he is uh, one of the greatest yachtsmen in the Delta. He's received every award. He's been Commodore of a couple clubs. Uh, so anyway, I just wanted to recognize him. He's a, just a charming person. I asked him if I could use some of his photos, so he sent me seven volumes of uh, photographs. <laughs> so. uh, Tom, Tom and Nancy Clothier out there, they had a boat, Zulu. I'll actually, I've got a picture of it. I'll show you. Uh, but um, they had her for many years, and some folks bought her and uh, kept her tied up in their backyard for many years. And she finally sank, and they took her over to Bob Walton's yard. And he worked on her, and it was, I guess, one of these projects where they'd come up with a few hundred dollars to do one plank. And she sat there for years, and uh, finally they decided to scrap her. But uh, Bob Walton's daughter salvaged the uh, sink out of the boat, and it's a planter in her backyard now, so things aren't, aren't really dying. So. Anyway, I'd just like to thank the Hagen Museum. Uh, I used some of their photos. They gave me permission. Uh, Ty gave me. Nikki Serrard, again, she's a, a fountain of information. Bill Connor, Dick Ingford, Doug Ingford, Dedrick Dennison, Mel Owen, Rusty. Uh, Tom Clothier, too. Uh, I, actually, last night I was putting the final touches on this, and we had a bad storm in Sacramento. You won't believe that, but uh, my power kept blinking off and on, so I thought I'd better shut it down. So anyway, I want to thank all of you folks for attending and uh, enjoyed being here. I brought some uh, Delta booklets and some maps and um, if they're uh, complimentary, if anybody wants one. So. Okay, buddy. Yeah, can I just show them? This is the this is the slide I didn't get in, but uh, this is Tom and Nancy's uh, boat Zulu before they uh, had Eslo, which I believe is parked right out in front, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, sad ending to a beautiful boat. Well, welcome again to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. Our guest today is Bill Wells, the executive director of the California Delta Chamber and Visitors Bureau. Um, Bill, um, what's the first recorded? Well, first, the uh, first question I have is, what is the range of the delta? What are the? What do you consider the northern and southern borders of the delta? Good question. Okay, for the delta chambers, we can <laughs> we consider it anywhere we can sell a membership. <laughs> but, uh, for those uh, people in Massachusetts <laughs> watching us uh, right now, uh, remember, uh, send in your yeah, money. Yeah, we uh, we'll take them. Uh, there, there's actually a uh, thing called the legal delta, which the state puts out, and it, it, it just roughly it's like Sacramento to. Uh, um, Antioch to Stockton um, and over to uh, around Venetia. Um, but the, the, really it's from, say, the, where the Feather River comes in down to Tracy to Stockton naturally um, and uh, down to the Straits of Carquinas. And so um, the confluence of the San Joaquin and the Sacramento Rivers created this gigantic recreational area that we currently use. When did, the, when did the levees start being put in place to kind of hold the shape of the sloughs? How early? Good question. Okay, 
Um, there were actually, originally, there were some uh, natural berms build up, you know, as the river changes uh, and just uh, the berms build up. The first recorded levee that I know about um, was on uh, Grand Island, and uh, a fellow built a levee out of peat there approximately, I, I think in the late 1850s or early 1860s. But if you remember in the early 1860s, there was a giant flood all over Northern California, and it washed out the levee immediately. So the levees didn't really get started in earnest until... Uh, the railroads were built, and then there was a lot of excess labor left over, and they started building the levees. Um, and so what's the current, what do you consider the population of, of the Delta to be? Uh, not including the major cities, I'd say half a million, something like the, the Delta proper. But we say that within the area, including the Bay and uh, Sacramento and Stockton, uh, about four million, five million. And how many, do you have any number of how many, any measure in how many boats are in the Delta? Uh, not exactly. There's okay. There's a lot of trailer boats come in, and we encourage that. In fact, if I'm buying gas somewhere, I will uh, if, if see a boat and give the guy some literature and have him call me. But uh, there's approximately 10,000 boat slips in the Delta. Uh, it used to be you couldn't find one to keep your boat in because they're all filled up. There's quite a few vacancies now, so roughly 10,000 on that. But I'd say easily another 10 or 20,000 uh, people visit the Delta during the on trailer boats. And so many of us have been up there year-round, but is there what you consider to be a season for the Delta, for recreation? Uh, my particular season that I like best is probably from late April until the end of October, something like that. I particularly like right after Labor Day, up and while the weather's still good, but everybody's back in school. Um, I like it cruising during the week more than weekends, frankly. <laughs> mm -hmm. And how does the population vary from the weekends? Is there a metric on how many boats are out or people are out on the weekends in midsummer? Um, well, I don't know how the exact figures, but uh, yeah, there's a you know probably a ratio of ten times more boats out during the weekends than than during the week. And how many of those boats are aground? Uh, <laughs> well, all the inexperienced boaters are all the hot shots. Uh, I, I got to tell you this one uh, story. Okay, these guys uh, are in an offshore boat from Discovery Bay, and uh, they come over to Moore's River boat for uh, dinner, and they pile back in the boat, and the guy sets his GPS to take him back to uh, um, Discovery Bay and, you know, puts the hammers down and takes off. Well, there's a big shoal and an island right at the confluence of um, the McCullumy River and the San Joaquin River, and he ran up, uh, the legend I heard is about 100 yards up on the river, and he's doing about 40 miles an hour. So you know, GPS doesn't necessarily bark every little thing out there. <laughs> <laughs> and, what, uh, and then uh, when I first joined the Classic Yacht Association, we used to go to Mimi Miller's house on Sand Mound Slough, and a friend of ours uh, took their uh, Stevens down to the end of Sand Mound Slough and ran aground. Now, this is like God, 25 years ago, and um, they had to swim ashore and call a... a, a somebody to come over and tow it off. $5,000. I mean, it would be $20,000 today, but that was real money back then. So, <laughs> so what's the... T in, in the bay, the tidal range is, you know, six, six feet or seven feet. What's the tidal height range in the delta, let's say at Stockton, right at Stockton and the 105, at uh, Highway 5? I-5? Five? Five, uh, I don't know, probably less than two feet, something like that. Mm -hmm. There's a definite tidal range there, though. Mm -hmm. But not as much as, as down here. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. Right. And so... Um, We've been listening to this discussion about the uh, Delta tunnels and um, uh, now the tunnel, a 40 foot diameter um, uh, uh, pipe would consume a great amount of water. And uh, what is the average depth of the water in typical sloughs in the Delta? You have a number? Yeah, most sloughs, uh, unless they're uh, dredged for some reason, probably. 10 feet, 6 or 10 feet, something like that. Georgiana Slough, I cruise up and down there all the time. It's generally pretty much around 20 feet, something like that. Sacramento River going up uh, from uh, Isleton, 15 or 20 feet. A few shallow spots, maybe down to 12. So for those who are studying the subject, it would be interesting to note what is net delta outflow. That's the amount of water net coming out of the delta. And how much can you put through a 40-foot diameter tunnel? Because I bet during the driest season that you're talking about a significant change in the amount of net delta outflow coming out. Yes. Um, I think we did the math on the tunnel one time. It's uh, like a, <laughs> a few hundred thousand cubic feet per second. I, okay, I, I talked to Mark Cowan one time, and I, I said, that, those two tunnels will take a lot of water. And uh, he says, well, we can put 15,000 cubic feet per second of water through a 10-foot diameter tunnel. So figure how much you can put through a 40-foot diameter tunnel. 
So, uh, and during the summer, sometimes the flow of uh, the Sacramento River at Freeport, which is just below Sacramento, gets down to about uh, 12,000 uh, cubic feet per second, something like that. So theoretically, the tunnel could suck the river dry. So is there any anyone who's planning less agribusiness in the uh, California Delta after the tunnels begin to diminish the flow of fresh water through the tunnels? Uh, I think everybody's thinking it's going to be business as usual. I mean, I, I, everybody's, I'm confident they're not going to actually build it. I mean, it's a, it'd be a vastly expensive project. Uh, and the tunnel, you think of a tunnel, but it's not really a tunnel. It's a bunch of parts uh, cobbled together with uh, gaskets and dowels. So uh, it's not like a, you know, like the Altamont Tunnel or something like that. I mean, it's... So um, while all this talk about tunnels is going on, it isn't that Southern California is the only place in the world that has a water problem. Uh, what about using the $20 billion proposed for the tunnel, the Delta Bypass Tunnel? What about using that $20 billion instead to uh, refine solar-powered desalinization technology that we could then sell to the rest of the world, to the Middle East, the Far East, and so on, all of whom have uh, water problems? Yeah, I think that'd be a great idea. By the way, the tunnel, uh, our estimate is going to be, Arnold Schwarzenegger said the canal was going to be like $55 billion. We estimate the tunnels are going to be like 55 to $75 billion, So uh, that's kind of a red herring when they say 20 But um, you can, um, uh, the technology for desal is getting cheaper and cheaper every day. The cost of desal water in uh, San Diego now is pretty comparable to, uh, to shipping Delta water down there. And not only solar, but they're uh, wave powered, right. and uh, there's a lot of uh, you know zero emission kind of uh, things. So yeah, it's got to be the future. I mean, you can't you can't keep re reallocating water from one group to another because eventually you run out. I mean, yeah, and uh, we're going to have to. Uh, come up with some new solutions, create new water. So how do you feel about those of us who think it's not smart to use a 13th century technology for a 21st century problem, rather use a 21st century technology? Yeah, I totally agree. I think it's a good idea. There, I mean, there's so many solutions. And one, um, you know, they could uh, build a desal plant on top of the mountains, uh, and the, the state owns the right-of-way from Monterey Bay on the highway going up there, pipe the water up there, lower pressure, you can, it's cost less to desal salvage the salts and minerals out of the water and then use the fresh water to water the farms down there. So there's a lot of solutions beyond building a tunnel. Great. Thank you. And we have a question from the audience. Uh, Staff Commodore Bruce Monroe. Yes. Uh, one of the places that is well known to the members of this Yacht Club is Herman and Helen's. Can you give us the history of that place and <laughs> why it's in the sad shape it is today? Yeah, it's really sad. That was one of my favorite places, too. I love the snack bar there. Uh, I'm not really sure... Uh, uh, they sold out. A friend of ours, uh, Joe Fazzo, and some other folks bought it for a while, and, and I think it's uh, they tried to bring it back. And it's I, as far as I know, it's in uh, receivership nowadays. But uh, yeah, real, I can't tell you much about. But it's uh, there's a bunch of derelict boats down there, not yeah. derelict boats, derelict ships uh, hanging out down there. So uh, yeah, it's a big problem in Stockton. Stockton, as you know, by the way, let that uh, the Sherman, uh, that old uh, the Alcatraz boat up there. And they were going to build a restaurant, and uh, it sat there for three or four years. I see it's down in Al or, uh, uh, San Rafael now. So, Leo, I'm sorry. Yeah, Leo. Thanks for joining the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon uh, live from the St. Francis Yacht Club. And as you know, we Facebook live stream this show as well uh, to different parts of the world. And we have a question from the Internet. Yes, the question. It's actually for me personally. Uh, com uh, okay, uh, comment. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, oh. mo moderator's prerogative. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, is there anybody in the anti-tunnel movement that's interested in advocating for regenerative agriculture rather than industrial agriculture, which has never really paid full market price for water? So yeah. if we restore and replenish the earth with our agricultural process, we won't need to take a 13th century approach to um, fixing uh, you know, our ecology. Yeah, I, th I think our, I've, I'm not, that's not my main focus, but uh, yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're looking for all kinds of... Uh, you know, out-of-the-box solutions, uh, modern solutions to the, the water and agricultural situation. Those of, you who, those of you who ask a question, remember to stay real close to the mic, like that distance away from the mic. Uh, eat, eat the mic, as everybody always says. Uh, we have a question from the audience from uh, champion sailor Mallory Cup winner Jimmy and artist DeWitt. An old man. When I was a young boy, I remember tying up a steamboat slough to the trees with some anchors out 
and a, a steamboat or something going by, and we'd rock away at night. Didn't there used to be a steamboat that took passengers up to... Yeah, that was uh, actually that's why we got the name Steamboat Slough. It was a shortcut between Sacramento and the Bay Area uh, to cut a few miles right. off. There's a uh, right near uh, uh, Snug Harbor. There's a shoal called uh, Hogback Shoal, and there's uh, been many a story of uh, boats being steamboats being wrecked there and uh, cut it too close. But uh, yeah, it's a pretty famous waterway up there. And by the way, you know, I, I used to go up there with my friends in the '50s, and it pretty much looks the same as it did then. That's what that's what I love about the Delta. Everything looks almost like it used to. Oh, that beach underneath the bridge was just great. Yeah, jumping off the bridge. Yeah. Well, yeah, I didn't, but we oh. had a member of the Richmond Yacht Club had a bear boat, and he'd sail it downwind onto the beach, and it, and then he'd just jump off of it oh, and wow. leave it there with the wind blowing it onto the breach. <laughs> huh? Bear boat. A bear boat. A bear, a bear boat. boat. <laughs> like a bird boat, a, it's but a little a little twenty four foot boat. Yeah, I'm Anyhow. familiar with them. They're nice boats. <laughs> So how many miles how many miles of cruising area are there in the delta? Uh, good point. That's, uh, the state says they're like 635 or something like that. Um, you hear Hal Shell always used to figure 1,000 miles, and that's what we use. That kind of goes back to uh, uh, the 50s. Uh, we researched the 1,000 miles, so somewhere between 600 and 1,000 miles. I think it's, uh, you know, 1,000 miles, especially nowadays people are using kayaks and stand-up paddle boards and stuff. You can get way up these little waterways. So many of us remember Al the Waps and, um, you know, the landing at Steamboat Slough. How many of those little places of business are there? Come on, mom and pop small businesses up in the Delta. I don't know. Three million? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, they're all, that's, that's another part of the charm of the Delta. Al the Waps is still there. Now they're, kind of, they're trying to call it Al's Place, not Al the Waps. Is there a PC but, name for Al the Waps? Uh, yeah, a PC name, yeah. But, by the way, WAP stands for without papers. That's, uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, yeah, it's still, it's, I mean, it still has the same, <laughs> same menu, same uh, dollar bill stuck on the, uh, on the ceiling. So uh, there's still a lot of really nice places. Quartz Pirate Slayer Cafe, uh, um, Snug Harbor. I mean, a lot of places look the same. So. Juice DJ. Yeah. How many acres of farmland in the California Delta? I don't know. A lot. Yeah. A lot. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> it's, as you're cruising down, if you have a boat like mine, you can't see over the tops of the levees. So everything, all you see is the levees. <laughs> but if you have a flying bridge, you can see, and there are. I mean, it's all what you're on the other side of the levees. It's all farmland. So there's a hell of a lot. So um, we have a question here. Yes, uh, not, Mel Owen. Question, but a little history. Pat Pending was formerly called Lightning and lived here at the St. Francis Yacht Club from 1931 to 1940. We bought it October 12, 1940, here at this dock. Wow! Holy cow, Mel! And that's a beautiful boat. I uh, had the pleasure of being your guest on that, on Pat Pending. It's completely a beautiful. Built in 1929, was it, Mel? That's yeah, right. 29. Right. I'd say she's more beautiful now, or at least last time I was aboard, than she was when she was launched. I'm pretty confident. <laughs> it's interesting, too, because the St. Francis Yacht Club, founded in 1927, was just two years old when the Stockton Yacht Club was founded. And so most people don't realize that yachting in the Delta has got quite a history, quite a long history, in fact. A question from the Internet. Yes. Yeah, this is from Melanie Ali. Um, there's quite a bit of spraying of chemicals into the Delta to reduce the hyacinth and other plants. We're hearing conflicting opinions about the impact of these chemicals in the ecosystem. Given that many of us are child and our children swim in the water all summer, what are you hearing about the impact of this, these spraying programs? Uh, the uh, spraying is not a good thing. It's uh, 2,4-D, so uh, uh, there's there limit on how much you can spray. You just can't spray willy-nilly out there, and the uh, government's got a lot of controls over it. They're looking at uh, some uh, biological methods of uh, controlling the... Uh, the plants, and uh, they've used mechanical harvesters. So uh, everybody's aware of the uh, problem with uh, chemicals, but the, the, the alternative of letting the hyacinth get out of control and the other plants, I think, is worse. Uh, it, if you remember a few years ago in the Delta, that was just inundated. And the, that actually kills, the plants themselves kill the fish because they take the water out, or the oxygen out of the water, and they uh, um, 
uh, are prime breeding grounds for mosquitoes and had a lot of problems with mosquito diseases up there. So yeah, I, I totally agree that we've got to find an alternative to chemicals, but for the moment, they're going to have to use them. One more question in the audience. John Harrington. Uh, it's a question here. Um, do you, are there conting contingency plans if we have an earthquake and some of the levees break on these large islands? Yes. Uh, okay, let me, uh, uh, that's, uh, I spent two and a half years on the uh, BDCP, that's the Bay Delta um, Conservation Plan. We call it the Bay Delta Canal Plan uh, Public uh, Panel. So the, the big thing they were talking about back then, this is like in the 2006, 2008, is uh, the, there's going to be an earthquake, it's going to destroy the levees on the Delta, and it's going to become a giant inland saltwater sea. Uh, the, in, again, in human history, there's never been a case of a delta damaged by an earthquake. Okay, there, I mean, it certainly could happen, but so far, no. Um, and uh, I've heard other stories of uh, people saying they uh, lived next to the uh, uh, levee and they could feel it vibrating when a ship comes by. Well, I've spent uh, many hours at the bar at Windmill Cove uh, drinking and... <laughs> Many ships have gone by, and I've, I've never experienced that. So, yeah, it's, I, I think it's kind of a red herring. Uh, after, you know, they got pretty well debunked, and then they started saying, well, the next thing, it's going to be an arc storm come in and destroy the delta. And by the way, I've stood next to levees when earthquakes happen, and I'm, not, I'm still here. So, but uh, <laughs> anyway, they, so they, you know, they got onto this thing about the arc storm, and that was a, a big thing for a couple of years. And if you notice right now, about with the, over the last few months, we've had three arc storms, an earthquake, and... Uh, king tides and the levees are still holding. So they, you know, they, they, uh, what they the, they try to point out is that um, the levees have been there since the 1800s, and they, you know, they don't talk about the maintenance. But the state spends millions and millions of dollars a year maintaining the levees and building up the riprap and stuff. So, um, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, that's a red herring to try to panic people into supporting their plan. So um, our guest today has been Bill Wells, Executive Director of the California Delta Chamber and Visitors Bureau. Our speaker next week will be Caleb Payne, bronze medalist and the only American medalist in the sailing competition at Rio de Janeiro last week. And uh, Bill, we want to thank you very much for being here. And with that, the luncheon is adjourned. <laughs> thank you so much, Bill. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. Um, there's plenty of maps and booklets up here if anybody would like to have one. We so. have swag, things to bring from about the Delta up here. Great. The only, the only thing, the uh, maps are printed by the government, so they leave out parts of the Delta, but uh, other than that, they're good. <laughs> anyway, thank you all. It's really been an honor to be here.